afternoon. Um, welcome everyone, uh, especially our distinguished guests from industry. Uh, this is the second technical, technical meeting of our uh, IUCRC Center, um, ASAP, Center for Aggressive Scaling by Advanced Processes. And we have uh, three talks today, if I can make my slight move. All right. Um, this is theme two and focuses on heterogeneous integration and particularly 3D heterogeneous integration. And again, just some logistics here. We uh, each, we have three presentations. Each presentation is 15 minutes. Uh, um, please hold your questions uh, to the end of all three presentations, but feel free to type in um, questions uh, using Q&A. Uh, uh, are we doing chat? Is it a chat box? Yeah, it's a chat box. Yeah. Okay. And. The presentation is recorded and will be shared to our industry members. And without further ado, the first talk is going to be presented. Uh, do I have both Linford and Paul online? Who's doing the presentation? I'm, I'm presenting. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. The first talk is by Professor Linford Gathered. Uh, he's going to talk to us about subsurface volumetric photonic integrated circuits. What's yours? I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for this opportunity to present our, our exciting work to industry. Um, so my name is Linford Goddard and I'm presenting subsurface volumetric photonic integrated circuits on behalf of our large group. So this is a collaboration between Paul Braun in material science and myself in electrical and computer engineering. And you can see the graduate students um, who are contributing to this project. So uh, first I want to talk about, um, so the outline, I'll talk about our vision for making volumetric photonic integrated circuits. Um, then I'll talk about our specific method called subsurface controllable refractive index via beam exposure. Uh, hide. Okay. Um, then I'll talk about some of the gradient refractive index elements that we can make. Um, and then I'll talk about our three dimensional waveguides and micro ring resonators, and then give an outlook and conclusion. So the first step is to define the problem. And our problem that we want to solve is to route data efficiently, both within and between uh, chips. So we have this vision of making this uh, really nice multifunctional three-dimensional optical interposer. The idea is that we will have these transmitter chips that consist of vertical cavity surface emitting lasers that may be mounted on their own CMOS uh, uh, transmitter chip. We have a separate receiver chip or we have a series of receiver chips. And we want to be able to take the light that's being modulated and the data that it has on it and get it from our transmitter chips uh, to our receiver chips. And these may be individual chips. These may be different parts on the same chip. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to develop this three-dimensional optical interposer. So because we're able to write three-dimensional structures inside the volume of a silicon wafer, um, we're able to make these um, diffract, or we can make these diffractive optical elements. We can also make coupling lenses and waveguides to send the light with low loss from one part of the chip to the other. We can make receiver diffractive optical elements that can do things like signal routing and signal splitting. So we can make copies of the signals that we're sending and distribute it to different parts of the receiver chip. So in terms of fabrication methods, um, there is a method that's known as ultra-fast laser inscription. And this method has been around for a significant amount of time, at least two decades. Um, in this method, you take a focused laser beam and you modify the material properties of the glass substrate. And so you can write structures such as uh, line voxels um, in this method. The challenge with this method is that the index contrast that you can achieve by using this modification of the glass is rather tiny. So it's on the order of 10 to the minus three up, a, up to about 0 0.06 index contrast. The other big challenge is that with these sorts of small refractive indices, you can't make very tight waveguide bends to be able to route the light in a three-dimensional way um, in a compact chip because the loss will be very high because the index contrast is low. Nevertheless, people have been able to demonstrate um, waveguides written with this ultra-fast laser inscription method. 
What we're going to talk about today is our method scribe. So this is the ability to write below the surface um, by selectively polymerizing regions inside a porous silicon substrate. So the idea is that because we're working with uh, changing the refractive index and uh, essentially creating uh, polymerized regions out of normally porous material, um, we can get very large index contrasts. So we're able to write structures where the index of the waveguide compared to the index of the background can be on the order of 0.4 to 0.6. This allows us to make very compact uh, waveguide bends. We can make bends with radii as small as 20 microns or below and still have less than a dB or so of loss. We can also write lenses because with our method, the focusing is a lot tighter than what you can do with the ultra-fast laser inscription because of the way that we're making these modifications. We're essentially polymerizing regions inside this nanoporous host. So this allows us to make free standing suspended structures where we don't even need supports. So shown here is a vertical horizontal cross section. This is our glass substrate. We have this porous silicon uh, material on top and we have an air interface at the top. And we can make these uh, self-aligned structures in which these are suspended and being held in place by the uh, nanoporous material. We can also make these larger area devices, such as these hyperbolic uh, metal lenses, where we're able to make um, really complicated cross-sectional geometries or three-dimensional geometries, um, which have different refractive indices. So this has a higher refractive index compared to the porous silicon background. So you can imagine that we can make um, uh, micro-optical elements below the surface of the wafer. So the scribe fabrication process follows like this. We start off with a highly doped silicon wafer. Um, we do an electrochemical porosification step where we create on the order of 80% uh, air inside this porous silicon host. Optionally, we transfer this porous silicon to a transparent quartz substrate. Most of what I'm gonna talk about today involves this transfer process. Um, optionally, we can oxidize the porous uh, silicon and turn it into porous silica. And that's typically what we do when we make these low loss waveguides. Then once we have this uh, porous silica on quartz substrate, we do a uh, vacuum casting with photoresist and we backfill the pores with the resist. Next, we do the, the direct laser writing and the laser power that we use with our uh, femtosecond laser source um, sets the local refractive index. And the reason is that we control the amount of polymer cross-linking that occurs inside of our voxel. And our voxel is on the order of 150 by 150 nanometers in the XY plane and 500 nanometers tall. And then finally, we develop and wash away any unexposed resist. So this is a negative resist. So we wash away any regions that we have not written. And we're left with uh, the cross-linked polymer which has high refractive index compared to the background in the regions that we did the laser writing. So we characterize the refractive index that we can write using a, a prism method. So we write prisms and we look at refraction. And you can see that if we don't write anything, this is our background index when we're working with porous silicon. We have a background index of about 1.3. And then at different wavelengths, we can get a refractive index going from about 1.55 to about 1.85. Um, as we increase the power that we're writing with. So we have an index difference between the background and the, uh, and the uh, highly written laser power of about 0.6. We have a continuous tunable range of about 0.3. And the size of the voxel does change as we write. So as we write at higher power, we get a little bit of cross-linking in the regions near to where we're focusing. And so the voxel size generally increases um, as we increase the laser power. Um, but the key point is that we have a widely tunable index range and we have submicron voxel sizes. If we look now at porous silica, um, we have a much lower refractive index for the background where we don't write. And we have this range that we can write continuously for the um, cross-linked polymer. And the voxel sizes generally are about the same, slightly smaller in porous silica. In recent work, um, we've, been ex we've been able to extend this range that we can write, so we can bring this lower and lower, and our record right now is that we can write all the way down to about 1.2 refractive index. 
So we've been able to essentially expand the continuously tunable range for the refractive index um, to be almost the entire range. So we're at about 0 0.3, 0 0.35 that we can change the refractive index continuously. So what does that bias, like the ability to define optics or define the refractive index locally um, in three-dimensional volume and be able to control the actual value? Well, the first thing is that we can write really amazing lenses. So subsurface, we can create structures known as Lunenburg lenses. Um, a Lunenburg lens is a special type of lens such that if I have an incident plane wave, it creates a focus exactly on the opposite side. And it doesn't matter the direction of incidence, the focus is exactly on the opposite side. We also can uh, create these, uh, so these structures are very high numerical aperture. So it's one over the square root of two or 0.7 is the numerical aperture of the Lunenburg lens. So these devices are very useful for omnidirectional light collection. They can also be used for cutting light from a fiber or a vertical cavity laser or into uh, a photodiode. Um, with a waveguide. So we can have a waveguide connected to such a lens. Now, people have done uh, Lunenburg lenses in the far infrared region through uh, using metamaterials. Um, their diameter and their sizes of devices are significantly larger than what we've been able to demonstrate. So we've been able to make as small as 15 micron diameter uh, Lunenburg lenses where we have a gradient refractive index profile for the lens. And we can see this at bottom image is the multi-photon fluorescence imaging. So there's a method by which we can determine the refractive index by looking at the fluorescence of the cross-link polymer. And we can see that there's a slightly higher intensity and therefore a higher refractive index in the center compared to the edges. Um, we measured these devices. We also simulated the devices and they agree very well. So at short wavelength 488, we can focus down to about 0.4 microns and the same for 633 nanometers. So we get relatively tight focusing um, with these devices. We've also made micro cylinder lens arrays. So the same idea as the Lunenburg device, except now it's extended in one dimension. And so this is the simulation of these 10 micron diameter uh, micro cylinder lenses. This is the experimental results. There's a tiny bit of tilt because our experimental setup wasn't perfectly flat, but we can capture these three dimensional volumes of how the light focuses at different locations um, through an advanced imaging setup that we built um, with a, uh, a far infrared camera that's able to measure um, all the way out to two microns. So probably the most important and interesting part of our work and how it pertains to uh, this heterogeneous integration is the idea of being able to make waveguides and microring resonators below the surface of the wafer. So we can write arbitrary three-dimensional paths and therefore connect our input and output ports of whether it's a fiber, whether it's a vertical cavity laser, whether we're bonding to a modulator like lithium nibate structures, and we can make these micro rings below the surface. So this device, I believe, was about um, 25 microns below the surface. Nowadays, our standard distance is 36 microns below the surface or 49 microns below the surface. In our very first attempt, so this was the publication from 2020, um, you can see the micro ring resonator has these very nice dips. Um, the one challenge is that the coupling loss is rather poor. So we're at 50 dB of insertion loss going from fiber into the waveguide and then back out. Um, in recent months, we've added a uh, lens coupler to be able to uh, collect the light from the fiber and focus it into the waveguide before it goes into the micro ring resonator. This produces a very efficient wideband coupling. So you can see from 1440 or 1450 to 1575, we have about the same amount of loss. So it's down now to 11 dB of coupling loss. We still maintain these very sharp dips and we're able to get um, efficient broadband coupling compared to other methods of integration where you use a grading coupler and you get narrowband uh, coupling efficiency. Um, just 30 minutes ago, uh, my students were in the lab, so we're pushing to try to get some last minute results that I could talk about today. Um, they managed to get down to uh, 5.95 dB of loss. So we've made significant strides over the past couple of months, and we see this technology as a way to get efficient three-dimensional routing of light. 
We have a roadmap that we believe is necessary for industry and academia to work together to realize the vision of these vertical photonic or these volumetric photonic integrated circuits. Um, academia is mostly working on the first six steps, so developing novel types of optics, passive devices, combining the different types of optics together, like I showed in the previous slide for like lenses and waveguides. We can also do a lot of different forms of multiplexing, so wavelength, spatial, and polarization multiplexing. We want to be able to build these efficient links on chip, but also going chip to chip. We're also exploring and excited about the potential of integrating laser sources inside the volume of these chips and also creating spatial light modulators, photo, photodiodes, electro-optic modulators, and so forth. And then doing device modeling. I think where industry really can help is thinking about how do we scale this technology up to manufacturing? So how can we increase the throughput of the process so that it's competitive with conventional silicon photonics? So being able to get to several eight to 12 inch wafers per hour in terms of fabrication, thinking about how we can make the process compatible with CMOS and integrate it with the devices. Um, because we can do volumetric things, you can imagine that we can make chips that could potentially just sit on top of CCD and can do some form of optical signal processing before it's received by the CCD, in addition to the application that I talked about, about data transfer, and then working on repeatability and reliability, and then finally developing a process design kit that others can use. Um, so with that, I'll conclude and just say that Scribe is an exciting new writing technique, which gives us a large refractive index uh, range. Um, we control the fill fraction of the resist inside the porous silica and silicon scaffolds. And we can make these novel micro optic and photonic devices such as lenses, photonic nanojet generators, gradient index, le gradient index lenses and axicons, 3D waveguides and microring resonators, and compact lensed fiber to waveguide couplers. So we see Scribe as being prime for industrial collaboration, and we hope to be able to attract uh, research and development funding um, to be able to realize these volumetric photonic integrated uh, circuit systems. So I'd like to thank Granger Engineering and NSF for the funding that was used to create these preliminary results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linford. Um, very good timing control also. Um, <laughs> if you could stop sharing, then I will pull up this uh, schedule one more time. So our next speaker is, uh, do, do we have uh, Professor John Dallasassi and John Beira. So the set talk is uh, on integrated photonics on silicon. And again, let's hold all the uh, questions to the end, but please feel free to type in and uh, record what you, you're thinking at, at the moment, because uh, in the end, some of these questions uh, could be addressed by multiple teams over here, and hopefully we get some uh, uh, better answers to, to questions. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And, and John is going to take the first half, and I'm going to take the second. So Excellent. All right, go ahead, John. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and opportunity. So in the first half, I'm going to talk about the unique integration schemes using epitaxial process. And the technology that I'll talk about uh, will be for basically for photonic sources, for lighting sources, LEDs, laser diodes, but it can also be applied for RF and power given the same material platform. So uh, okay. in terms of capabilities, in MNTL and Illinois, we can process various kinds of light sources with different spectral wavelength from entire UV to visible with the nitrite materials with complete solutions. And in terms of integration, here are some examples of our uh, former experience, mainly using localized epitaxy. We can fill in trenches up to 200 millimeter wafers, and we can create these pockets used for different devices. And in this case, this was an a hand device, electrical device. Now, today, what I want to talk about is a, a new type of material, new type of integration platform called uh, cubic nitrate. So we are all familiar with gallium nitrate material system. And the material system we are familiar with is hexagonal. It's six-fold symmetry. 
What I will talk about is a way of creating a new material, cubic material, similar to arsine phosphine material family. Now, this material is interesting because it's a direct band gap and it has a smaller uh, that a smaller band gap, so you can achieve uh, visible emitters with less indium. It also has higher ele better electrical performance in terms of mobility, lower acceptor energy, meaning higher doping. It's polarization free, so you can enable uh, much higher efficiency devices, uh, larger drift velocity, higher uh, uh, speed devices, much larger optical gain, lower threshold, and it has, of course, cleavage plane because it's cubic and cubic and lower ogelosis. So overall, this cubic nitrites is a new type of family that can be integrated on CMOS platform. This has been first shown in 2014, and I'm going to show how this process works. It's based on an industrial process, MOCVD. If we try to deposit gallium nitrite on conventional methods on to silicon CMOS, you know, you get a non-selective multicrystal, basically a random process, but we have a technique to selectively nucleate these crystals so that we have a single phase controlled and we can create different types of shapes, lines, similar to waveguides. Now, if you look into this, this is a mimic of aspect ratio patterning technology. So aspect ratio patterning technology basically has silicon dioxide sidewalls and you open the trench and you deposit conventional 35, such as gallium arsenide and germanium shown here. Because defects follow the growth direction using the aspect ratio, you can trap these defects and have a defect free top surface. So this can be done and we can do these type of technologies. Now, what's interesting is if we pattern silicon 100 to expose silicon 111 facet, we create a different type of aspect ratio pattern technology where we have a void and we see this kind of different features. So looking into this, what we notice is the conventional hexagonal gallium nitride nucleated on silicon 111 is transitioning into cubic gallium nitride. This is because a hexagonal 0001 direction is equivalent to zinc plant cubic 111 direction. In other words, if you have a cube in your hand, if you rotate it in the right way, you will see a hexagon. So we have looked into this in details, looking in X-ray diffraction, as well as looking into selective area diffraction confirming that the incoming phases are worsite and the result after SIM is zinc plan. And overall, we have these phase boundaries filtering the defects. Looking into this under high resolution reveals very high quality order and virtual defect free structures on top suitable for devices. And we recently showed scaling of these technologies onto even large area uniformly and overall, using these new aspect ratio patterned structures, we can deposit various type of materials that could be suitable from applications for vertical to lateral with different goals. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can um, see uh, see my uh, screen and presentation mode here. Um, yes. My waiver induction. Um, I'm uh, John Dal Sassy. Uh, I'm a professor here at Illinois. I've been here for about ten years. Prior to that, I spent about twenty years in industry um, in a variety of uh, roles uh, for a variety of company sizes. Uh, my group does a number of things uh, beyond uh, just the heterogeneous integration that we'll talk about here, um, including work on uh, photonic devices for min infrared applications, uh, nitride photonics, you know, and modeling capabilities. So the, the goal of what we're doing is to be able to bring other sorts of materials than silicon onto a silicon platform and a wafer scale plot process such that we can create defined regions of uh, photonic, for example, functionality or electronic functionality um, on a silicon wafer that may have uh, electronics coming, say, out of a front end of line process um, in a CMOS fab. 
Um, an example of, of the sort of thing that we'd like to do would be a, a dense system for facial recognition, for example, where we heterogeneously integrate a VIXEL array with a CMOS imaging array um, in order to make devices more compact um, and enable, again, more functionality on a, on a given, uh, given chip. Uh, the particular method that we've been working on here um, is uh, uh, a method that we call epitaxial transfer. Um, this is shown in kind of a flowchart form here. What we're envisioning um, and, and have been working on is a, a process where we take our 3-5 wafers, uh, which may have different epitaxial growths on them, perhaps you know, some VIXEL wafers, some detector wafers, um, those are diced into pieces um, and uh, are mounted using a temporary bonding process epi side down on a silicon carrier wafer. Um, we have a second wafer that's simulating a wafer coming out of a silicon front end of line process. Um, we uh, do processing on this to precisely define where those three, five epi islands are located. Um, do a bonding process, and then ultimately fabricate the photonic devices on the silicon host wafer after we've done the epitaxial transfer. And this is sort of the unique aspect of what we're, of what we're doing here. And of course, the ultimate goal is to produce um, an electronic photonic integrated circuit. If we look at an edge-on view of what this process looks like following a single island through this process, uh, we start again by mounting our 3-5 material epi side down on the silicon carrier wafer. Um, we can then go through a, uh, a lapping and polishing process followed by a chemical etching and dry etching to reduce the material to the thickness of the epi itself. Um, then in a wafer scale process, we can pattern where those islands are located. So, so the, initial, the initial process here can be done very coarsely, uh, basically even hand placing the 3-5 material um, on, uh, on our carrier wafer, although we, we envision ultimately using something like a pick and place process to do that. Um, and then when we photolithographically define the islands by uh, depositing a hard mask, patterning that photolithographically, we now have islands that are very precisely referenced both to each other and to features on the silicon carrier wafer. So that when that wafer is bonded to our silicon host, we have a single alignment process that fixes all of these islands precisely relative to uh, features um, in the silicon host wafer. And, and this would be done in a uh, uh, conventional wafer bonding process. Um, you know, tools like, for example, the EVG uh, wafer bonding tool allow micron, micron to submicron uh, wafer to wafer bonding accuracy. Following that, we uh, remove uh, the silicon carrier wafer. Um, this was a temporary bond, um, temporary bonding material that we used. What we're left with are um, epitaxial islands that are epi side up on a silicon host wafer. And those can then be processed into uh, devices using um, standard uh, uh, processing technologies for those types of devices. This is showing um, not in a cartoon form, but actually uh, with some pieces that we've walked through this. You can see here um, the uh, material that's been uh, bonded uh, using temporary bonding material epi side down to a silicon wafer. Uh, we then go through, in our case, a hand lapping and polishing process. Um, after the thinning to the thickness of the epi, we can then pattern and precisely define where our three, five islands are located. So if we look now at this region here, after that process, what we're left with is a very precisely defined array 
of uh, three five material. Um, there's a number of different bonding materials we can use. We focused on gold free bonding, obviously, to maintain compatibility with CMOS. Uh, we're using palladium germanium um, on our uh, N type gallium arsenide, both to form an ohmic contact and because we can then use an, an aluminum germanium eutectic bond in order to form the permanent bond onto the silicon host wafer. Um, that's what this looks like here. And then, of course, after our fabrication process, we can either fabricate uh, uh, multiple photonic devices or individual photonic devices on these uh, chiplets, uh, depending upon the size island that we create in our photolithographic process here. Uh, the mechanical properties of the bonds are good. Um, you can see a, a FibSem here showing the 3-5 material bonded to our silicon host, a close-up of that showing the bond. Um, shear strengths uh, are good. In fact, uh, the material is breaking at this point. Um, and uh, contact resistances are acceptable, um, not quite as good as, uh, say, a gold germanium uh, contact, but, but acceptable. We've applied this technique to a couple of different types of devices. Um, we've applied it to uh, um, light emitting transistors. These are light emitting transistors shown here uh, with decent results. And we've also more recently applied it to vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. Um, and an, inter an interesting feature of this is that uh, if we look at the shift in wavelength uh, versus drive current for the devices that we've transferred to the silicon versus devices um, on their native substrate, we see much better performance. And of course, that's expected because silicon has a much better thermal conductivity than uh, um, than gallium arsenide does. In fact, if we compare that to other techniques, um, you know, flip chipping, et cetera, we see a significant improvement relative to those. And the key thing to point out here is that these devices are fabricated after we do the epitaxial transfer process. Um, looking forward, we're interested in applying this techniques to uh, devices for high, high speed uh, data center applications and multiple wavelength applications. And we can use some techniques we've developed for doing single mode, single polarization devices to these. You know, we've looked also at the possibility of using other sorts of materials, uh, say long wavelength tunable lasers, we can do tech detectors and ultimately integrate all of this for silicon photonics. Uh, beyond that, uh, we're not limited to laser material. We could integrate uh, detector material if we wanted to say regions where we can do long wavelength uh, imaging uh, coupled with say CMOS image sensors uh, for doing things like hyperspectral imaging going out to, you know, probably close to the two micron wavelength range. We could integrate heterojunction bipolar transistors and hemp's for high-speed integrated electronics. Um, and, and of course, we could also apply the process to you know, other sorts of emerging materials and devices. So I'd um, like to acknowledge uh, the sponsors uh, who helped fund some of the preliminary work on this, the NSF and the 26 Foundation, and uh, would like to thank everyone uh, here um, for their time today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, we just heard two talks, one's monolithic integration, the other one's uh, uh, using transfer, different kinds of transfer bonding. Um, so thank you. And the next one, I see Larry just splashed in and the Professor Kun show cat. Um, so you can uh, start sh sharing your screen. Uh, I will just read the title of the uh, this third, last but not least talk is on Vixel on silicon and the photonics, uh, uh, photonic crystal Vixel arrays. All right, thanks everyone. Can you see my presentation screen? Yes. Um, are you seeing the right PowerPoint screen right now? No. I'm not seeing this presentation mode. I see. Yeah. Did that okay. work at all? Uh, yeah. Yep, there. Oh, cool. Okay, great. All right, um, yeah, thanks everyone. So I think uh, there, we've seen a lot of exciting Themes that have been mentioned 
And uh, we're going to hit on a lot of those same themes, but from a slightly different angle. So we just called this short uh, introduction here, heteroepitaxial vixels on silicon. And so my name is Minju Larry Lee, and this is a, a joint presentation with Professor Kent Shaket. Okay. So um, basically what I'd like to do is tell you uh, in this first half of the talk about capabilities in my research group and how that kind of dovetails with some new ideas and capabilities in, in uh, Professor Shaket's lab. And then we hope to show by the end how that ultimately leads towards novel devices that could include something like 1.5 micron pixels on silicon. And uh, there's going to be a role to be played for both heteroepitaxial growth and potentially also uh, porous DBRs. So uh, that's a very similar theme to some of the things uh, uh, Linford Goddard was talking about in the first talk, okay? All right, so this is just an overview of some types of things we do in my lab. Uh, my group is, we are an MBE growth group. And uh, here's some examples of uh, neat things we get to make. And again, a lot of the stuff I'm gonna talk about and a lot of stuff in this slide is from collaborative work. In fact, uh, this beautiful red laser picture uh, was taken with a lot of help from Professor Dallas Assi's uh, uh, crew. And we've gotten to publish a paper together on that. I should also mention that our visible laser work has been funded uh, partly by Lincoln Labs and partly by DARPA in an ongoing effort. So I see uh, Rule Swint is, is here on this call now. And so we do growth, we do characterization of many different kinds, and we uh, like to work our way up to making some proof of principle devices. And uh, we also love to collaborate with people who have great processing expertise, for example. Okay, so uh, here's some prior work, and this was a paper that we published with uh, some of the support from Lincoln Labs. And this is just an example of visible lasers that we did on silicon. Now, the application uh, for visible in this case is um, kind of forward looking. It might have something to do with uh, trapped ion quantum computing and some other um, uh, very interesting futuristic things. Um, and the lasers that we're gonna propose for this one are more like at the 1500 nanometers. So I just want to differentiate that clearly. Um, but what this example uh, shows is the kinds of things that we grow in my lab. So it's a pretty standard phosphide laser. We can do it either with quantum dots or with quantum wells. Um, and in fact, the way we grow the dots, it's, it's actually called a so-called dot in a well structure. Okay, so this is a, a basic kind of structure we can grow. And we've been working on doing this on top of silicon. Okay, now uh, here are some laser results that just kind of summarize uh, the progress so far in this. And uh, we are very good at growing these lasers on uh, gallium arsenide wafers, uh, both the quantum wells and the dots. Um, but now we also have uh, shown that we grow them on silicon and we do see a threshold current density hit. Uh, we have a lot of ways in which we think we can narrow this gap. But even with that hit, we are still looking at um, pretty good broad area laser uh, threshold currents, okay? So um, that's just sort of a starting point now. So what, what new ideas can we do uh, based upon some of this expertise? So I wanna talk about um, a longstanding problem or challenge in our field of growing three fives on silicon. Um, of course, uh, gas on silicon is quite challenging, but indium phosphide on silicon is even more challenging, okay? and in order to do that, um, it looks like people are needing metamorphic buffers that might be towards 10 microns thick. And because there's a coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch between 3.5 and silicon, you can get thermal cracking uh, pretty easily in such a scenario. Okay, so one of the things that um, I started thinking about with my longtime collaborator uh, and former Illinois colleague, Dan Wasserman, was whether we could kind of recruit, reuse the thickness of metamorphic buffer, which is grown and designed to sort of manage and control dislocation flow and see, can we get some optical functionality out of that? You know, we're not gonna put an active region down here, but it could, for example, serve as the lower cladden laser. So we managed to demonstrate some of those lasers back in 2016. And this was something where we collaborated with NREL where they actually grew well, a so-called metamorphic or lattice mismatched buffer. And they actually had uh, alternating aluminum content such that this was actually a distributed Bragg reflector that was at the bottom of a very high efficiency multi-junction solar cell, okay? So we have this uh, idea to use 
the metamorphic buffer layer to get additional functionality. It could be like a bragger reflector. It could be a lower clad. It could also become porosified. And that's sort of uh, one of the uh, exciting things that hopefully we want to start pushing into. Okay. And I'll mention a little bit more, and then Kent is going to show some calculations um, about where nanoporous materials could play a role. Okay. So I think um, one of the steps that I want to take, and this is a very general platform thing, is I think as a field, we need to make progress in our ability to grow indium phosphide on silicon. Um, there's been huge progress in going gas and growing gas on silicon lately. Um, it, yes, it is an older field, um, but the progress um, in the past few years has been really rapid. And so, for example, there's a publication with a pretty moderate threading dislocation density with only a two micron thick buffer. Okay. Now, in contrast, indium phosphide on silicon is much higher dislocation density. That's TDD. Okay. Now, in parallel to all that development in the silicon photonics world was development as ultra high, ultra high efficiency multi-junction solar cells. So this is an example of indium phosphide on gas. It's used to make a six junction world record solar cell. And also the threading dislocation density at the top is 1E6. Okay. So the question is, how can we combine these two uh, breakthroughs to get indium phosphide with well-controlled threading dislocation density and 10 times lower than the state of the art? Okay, and I don't think there's going to be one answer. I think it's going to be a cocktail answer. Um, and that's some of the uh, new things that I want to work on. And uh, we hopefully will get to uh, show that we can do additional photonics engineering using porosity as another knob. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and kind of hand it back over to Kent. All right. Continue. And I'm going to start sharing my slides. Can you see that? Yes. All right. So uh, my name is uh, Kent Choquette. Uh, I've been at Illinois for, uh, well, the past 22 years after uh, spending some time at uh, Sandia National Labs and uh, Bell Labs. Um, and the uh, my group is uh, involved in the, uh, not so much on the materials, as you heard from, uh, from Larry, but more on the processing and on the device uh, design and fabrication and characterization. And for, uh, well, for, for the past 30 some years, I've also been really focused on the vertical cavity surface mitting lasers. And so we do a lot of VIXEL work in my group. Uh, we make all kinds of different devices. Uh, we have some efforts looking at uh, modulation and we're trying to uh, get uh, high uh, direct modulation speeds. But what I'd like to uh, kind of uh, advertise or, or discuss in terms of the uh, kind of work that we're like to propose is to uh, uh, describe, come on. Oh yeah, whoops. Okay, yeah, is to describe some of our work on uh, coherent uh, pixel arrays so showing here, as well as some of our work on uh, uh, 1.5 micron pixels. So the reason that we're interested in uh, coherent arrays is that uh, uh, if, in recent years, literally in the last five years, uh, there's been a tremendous change in the uh, in the pixel world. Uh, in the past, we were very focused on uh, applications that required single devices. Um, and literally overnight, uh, due to the advent of uh, mass uh, of, of uh, uh, things like smartphones, pixel uh, uh, arrays now are being uh, produced. And so today, uh, the number of pixels has just got skyrocketed, skyrocketed because of we essentially are making as many arrays as we were making single elements in the past. So we've been looking at coherent arrays where the lasers are all coupled together. Uh, this is an example of, uh, of a six element ring array that we made. Um, this is a combination of using photonic crystals to define the uh, the, the optical properties, as well as uh, ion implantation to get, create selective uh, uh, injection. And what we can do is essentially uh, engineer the modes in these, uh, in these ring arrays such that we can um, essentially get single mode emission out of a very, very narrow divergent uh, beam, uh, something over two degrees. Um, and so uh, we feel that this is a real path toward uh, high brightness uh, by hopefully scaling this up. Now, another approach for a high brightness laser uh, is what's called the pixel, which is the photonic crystal surface mining laser. Um, and the idea behind the pixel is that you, it, it's, it, the idea is to essentially take a distributed feedback laser and make it two dimensional. And so you're, you have essentially control in two dimensions to uh, control that mode. 
uh, we can actually get enhancement of the gain. But the, the beauty is, is that you can have a scalable Gaussian mode out of these devices. Um, and this is a technology that's really been, it's been pioneered in Japan, um, and they have been pursuing uh, a lot of great work. But if you look into the details, uh, it, some of the things that are being done aren't necessarily uh, good for, uh, for scaling up in power and brightness. And so we're looking at trying to make low index contrast structures, uh, basically you combining some of the processing that we do with some of the uh, uh, growth and uh, regrowth that, uh, that Larry's uh, group can, can do. So I don't know why, here we go. I, my, uh, there, we, whoops. Um, so uh, basically we are, uh, we, this is a program funded by the DOD. Um, that we've been working on uh, already. Uh, this is some example we're using uh, essentially triangular uh, uh, photonic crystal lattice to define our uh, structure. Creates uh, resonances here down around, uh, first order resonances around the uh, 500 nanometer regime, which implies that we need to use e-beam lithography, uh, which is good because here at Illinois, we have one of the best North Ameri uh, machines in North America to do this, 150 keV machine. Here are some examples of some of the patterns we've written. And what we'd like to do is to take these and then overgrow higher index material such that we can create a, a cross section like this where the mode is essentially pulled up into the photonic crystal um, and actually hopefully thrown out the top. And so this is a path that we think is promising for uh, high brightness uh, sources. And again, it represents a, a good example of the of the uh, uh, when we uh, combine our uh, abilities, uh, Larry and I, that we actually get a bigger bang for our uh, buck. So <clears throat> I'm going to finish up by describing uh, the proposal that uh, of, of trying to look at a long term problem, which is 1.5 micron pixels, and to think about whether we could uh, combine this technology with silicon photonics. Because I, I could argue that uh, right now the two biggest emerging areas are silicon and photonics are silicon photonics and pixels. And they seem to be uh, orthogonal, uh, both in terms of uh, their the direction of light as well as, as their compatibility. So uh, the, the idea here is, is that we'd like to re uh, uh, rely on some interesting ideas that have come up, again, based on porosification. Uh, so uh, almost 10 years ago, there was some work here at Illinois, uh, Paul Braun's uh, lab, uh, looked at looking at using porosified silicon, uh, where you can control the, the porosification such that you could build a distributed Bragg reflector. And this is an example of a, such a structure. And, and there were some demonstrations that we did uh, for the light emitters. What we'd like to do is to take this idea um, and rather than silicon, think about using an, an indium phosphide. Because it turns out indium phosphide is, is very straightforward for uh, electrochemically uh, inducing a porosity. So if you think, and, and it's done through basically changing the uh, impurity incorporation in the, in the indium phosphide. So if we could basically build a stack where we have uh, alternating, essentially this is a, a doping super lattice because we're using n-type impurities to uh, affect the porosification uh, uh, process. Um, in that such a structure here, you could, whoops, you can think about a, a period, a high index and a low index, and again, what we're doing is, is we're taking indium phosphide and we're reducing the, the natural uh, index through porosification. And if we can get a 20% reduction of index, which has been demonstrated in the literature, a 10 parent DBR is sufficient for uh, getting a, uh, uh, a high reflectivity DBR. And this is what these calculations are showing. So we really think this is a promising approach that really attacks a long standing problem because Basically, 1.5 microns that the second Vixel paper ever written was on, was, it was an attempt at long wavelength, and it's always been a problem. And the problem has been that we don't have good mirrors, that uh, there's no, the natural materials don't have high enough index contrast. Um, and so we think that this, uh, this porosification process is a way to avoid this issue. And in addition, because of the fact that we, if we can um, introduce this in the, uh, in the layers that we're going to use in uh, mar marrying this technology to silicon, as uh, Larry described, we feel that this is a way that we can 
not only achieve 1.5 micron pixels, but also achieve it in a way that could be compatible with uh, uh, integration with silicon photonics. So with that, I'm gonna uh, stop. Uh, you heard some of the capabilities in uh, Larry Lee's group, uh, primarily focusing around uh, MBE and uh, the uh, development of uh, uh, heteroarchitectural materials uh, uh, for, opti for optical electronics. You've heard about some of the things that we're doing in my group on Vixels. And together, we are uh, really hoping that we can kind of combine our capabilities to, uh, to uh, look at some interesting problems, one of which might be a uh, 1.5 micron pixel on silicon. So with that, I will uh, stop and uh, thanks for uh, tuning in today. Thank you very much, Ken. All right, so now uh, is time for Q&A. Let's go with our English Street members first. Um, you can just unmute and speak up. I think most of the questions in chat is already answered. Uh, surely maybe we can repeat some questions, the ones, um, you know, maybe people were joining in and going in and out, so they may not have seen all the questions. But uh, yeah, so it's up to you how you want to do this, but I'd, I'd prefer. Okay, I, I, can, I can read those questions. Uh, my questions are too detailed, it's too specific. Uh, so I, I'm gonna uh, read the, uh, the question from uh, uh, R. Ma, okay. And what are some uh, unique applications that could benefit uh, such small um, Lunenburg lenses that's made by Linford's uh, technique? the world's smallest lens. So I'll, I'll read my reply from the chat. So the main application of the small Lunenburg lens so far has been to be able to focus the light into a subsurface waveguide or to collect the light from a subsurface waveguide. Um, typically, our waveguides are about 1 to 1.2 microns in diameter. They have a relatively high index contrast, so you get a pretty fast divergence coming out of the waveguide. And to be able to match the numerical aperture, if you're going to couple into fiber, um, you need to convert that, that numerical aperture with this sort of lens. Um, and then a second application is that we're thinking about these sorts of 2D and 3D systems. So you can imagine the simple 2D array of Lunenburg lenses, and those would be useful for um, either collecting light from a two-dimensional array of pixels, like Kent has just talked about, um, nano lasers, which are highly divergent, and the directional emission may be a, a challenge or, or of interest. Um, you can place a Lunenburg lens very close to one of these sorts of nano lasers. And then for the receiving side, you can imagine you have your standard CCD chip and you want to do something on each pixel. So you create the Lunenburg lenses above the pixel and that increases the collection area, or you do some sort of optical processing. And that's sort of the two dimensional approach. The three dimensional approach is now you have a two dimensional array of Lunenburg lenses. You have a two dimensional array of diffractive elements or another two dimensional array of Lunenburg lenses. And now you can form an imaging system um, inside the chip. All right, thank you. Hey, Linford, does it go the other way? If you, uh, if you have a, a, a highly uh, a, a focus uh, source on the Lunenburg fence, does that generate a, a plane wave on the other end? Yeah, so if you have a, a focus light that's coming to a point at the Lunenburg lens's back surface, um, then it'll come out as a collimated beam on the opposite side. By the way, how dense can you make these? How dense in, in the sense of how closely can we space things? Yeah. So um, we can write in three dimensional volumes. And so our voxel is um, uh, 150 nanometers by 150 by 500. So you can imagine we can pack these lenses directly next to each other um, if you don't care about the crosstalk so much. Um, there's some practical limitations that you may get some merging of, of things that you write, but there's really no limitations on what we can write. So we can essentially create any three-dimensional uh, refractive index profile that someone decides is, is useful for their application. Great, thank you. Impressive. Thank you. Linford, one question here, Rule Swint Lincoln Laboratory. Uh, you probably had it in your talk, but I just missed it. What was the uh, typical propagation losses that you have in, the, in those wavelengths? Yeah, so the propagation losses are still being uh, determined and measured. Um, so 
I would say our best guess is on the order of 2 dB per millimeter. Um, there are certain amounts that are due to um, like we just haven't really like we haven't focused on improving the propagation loss by doing things like uh, there are many things that people do in standard methods like resist reflow or uh, multi-pass writing or annealing. We haven't done any of that stuff yet. Um, I think some of the other challenges that uh, we're also exploring are like the bending loss. So we know that for our 30 micron radius bends, the loss is below what we can measure, which is about 0.1 dB. So as long as we're above 30 microns, we have negligible bending loss. The propagation loss, though, it's a little bit hard to decouple from the lens coupling loss. And so we're still like trying to trying to extract that number. Any other questions from the audience? Anybody can unmute, just ask directly. Maybe I can fill the gap. Um, so several of the talks talk about the porous porosity and using electrochemical control. And actually any of our semiconductor, a stage of uh, porosity is before you completely re remove it. But this is not new. Um, so what are the, the major challenges and what the, what's the unique capability um, our team can, can provide? Maybe Larry can say something how, how you're gonna do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll start the answer. I mean, I, I think yeah. that um, me and Kent think that the fact that porous indium phosphide is not new, that it's well-established in the literature and there's uh, good recipes for it and good property measurements. Is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> you can think of it as a strength, yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I guess where one way that I'm sort of coming at it from is, in terms of uh, growth on silicon, we need to make the DBRs as thin as possible in order to avoid uh, the cracking problems. Um, and you know, basically, we need to put all that material to work, whether it's engineering dislocations or whether it's engineering an optical mode, um, because we only have so much thickness we can put onto a three five of three five on silicon, maybe five or six microns, about it. Um, and so that's my perspective, and it also happens to go hand in hand with the relatively poor index contrast that you can naturally grow on indium phosphide wafers. So that's, I guess that's my uh, growth standpoint uh, idea about the answer. Kent, could, do you wanna fill in more blanks? Well, I, I was gonna actually uh, uh, ask, answer, maybe address this from a, a little higher level in the sense that what is the unique capability that the uh, University of Illinois uh, offers mm -hmm. and, and specifically the Holognac Microelectronics Lab. Um, and what I would argue is that there's a long, a rich history here of, of, of um, materials development, but materials development targeted toward devices and applications. Um, and so this is what you've really heard today is that we're taking, you know, uh, all these groups are taking ideas, uh, you know, porosification of various materials and trying to apply them in ways that are very, you know, that are, that are that are new and unique. You've heard about, you know, three-dimensional interconnects. You've heard about new ways of making DBRs just from porosification. Uh, and the, um, and I will also have to say that there's been a lot of fundamental work on understanding uh, uh, this this uh, technique of porosification in in silicon, for example. Uh, our session chair is an example of that. So you know, there's a lot of uh, of, uh, of, a, of a tradition, a history of of basically. You know, getting a lot of uh, tools and techniques, but then just applying them toward uh, toward uh, devices that uh, that matter, um, and and I think that's the, the the real strength. And so, you know, any one of us has has our own capabilities, but the, it's the combined uh, potential of all of us in this building, you know, focused on optoelectronics. I mean, I think you've heard we had three different groups talking about uh, different ways, essentially, of of looking at optoelectronics using silicon. <laughs> yep, that's what the heterogeneous integration is. Uh, is everybody needs some of those? Uh, and can I add? Uh, also, can, can, well, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, can I add to that? So another strength of Illinois, I would say, is that we go all the way from devices to systems. So we have people who can do fundamental device modeling, people who can do 
um, the individual devices who can do the nanofabrication, who can do the characterization, um, who can look at applications of what we are building to solve real world real world problems. So I would say the breadth of research expertise, um, being able to tap the strengths of people in the building and also people who are closely affiliated um, is definitely a major strength. The metrology part is something I think we didn't really have time to, to highlight that, which is the Linford's uh, work also. Um, when it was three 15 minutes talk and uh, hopefully we give, uh, um, give everybody a, a glimpse of what the capability is uh, and uh, if there is uh, uh, other problems that's, that you, you want to pose and we're all open to that also. Well, if you have a little bit of time, I have a question uh, mainly for uh, our second talk. So we've had some interest in uh, RF integration. So, uh, you know, I wanted to check with um, John, he's been doing, you know, free nitride and so on, as well as John. So what, what are the limitations and challenges of doing, you know, full-blown digital RF uh, analog CMOS circuitry together? And is that a capability that, uh, you know, Illinois has? Uh, I know that we have uh, people from Mitsubishi, so Rui is here. He's been doing a lot of um, three nitrides. Dan Tio is here as well. So I think I'm asking the question on their behalf, but Tio and, and Rui, you can always uh, unmute yourselves and ask us questions. So, that's a very, very good question. So, so we've already applied this technique to uh, 3N materials. I didn't mention that specifically because, you know, it's fairly new and I didn't really want to talk about it. But we um, we actually took uh, Ganon silicon and integrated that. Actually, Ganon silicon is easier to do the epitaxial transfer process with because it's very easy to get the silicon off of the GAN. Um, comparatively speaking, um, and, and we've done that with some other things as well, and, and looked at both integration of uh, um, of light emitters, you know, so LEDs possibly for again, you know, on chip blue communications, but you know, we also were using FET structures. We we have an idea of doing nitride and you know, basically nitride photonics since since three uh, N materials. Um, you know, especially where you've got high sheet charge densities can have high fields in them. And that field couples into the electro optic effect, we can actually make 3N modulators that are uh, modulating light by controlling the sheet charge density in effect. So, you know, so, so we're, you know, we've done some of that, we're interested in that, you know, again, this technique can be applied to, uh, um, you know, at this point in time, you know, I would say any three five material. We haven't looked beyond that, but uh, but we feel pretty confident about those. And you know, and, and you know, John of course has a lot of interesting things going on with the cubic work as well. You know, I'll let him talk about that. Yeah, I think um, uh, to answer, you know, very directly, uh, yes, Illinois has the capabilities to address those challenges. And we really need and appreciate the feedback and uh, interest from the company so that we can tailor our solutions per their needs. For example, in the local epitaxy of integration of gallium nitride direct on you know, CMOS silicon, we engineer these pocket dimensions. The pocket dimensions that I shown, some of them are geared towards virtual reality emitter displays. Uh, so augmented reality displays. So there's the reason they are relatively smaller size. But for other applications, those could be engineered to be on the larger size, depending on how much area is needed. So one way to think of this is uh, we can consider these technologies as separate and giving the total wafer volume as the full solution. And we can certainly uh, locally uh, create these uh, pockets for industry to build upon. Thank you. Um, well, um, we're almost, I think, six minutes over our time limit, but if there are any other questions from our industry members, particularly, we'd love to hear from you. So please let us know.
Well, I have many questions on GAN, CMOS and other things, but uh, I do not want to keep asking them. Um, so maybe we'll chat another time, but thank you everyone for being here. And our uh, third um, webinar will be hosted using the same Zoom link three weeks from today on uh, March 23rd, same time. And that will focus more on uh, circuits aspects of uh, the things that we've been doing. Um, Julie, anything else? I just wanted to to add we we uh, we should have acknowledged our industry guests uh, who dialed in and really appreciate that. Uh, um, so thank you and please feel free to to reach out to to any one of us uh, for further discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You, everybody. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you, you to all the presenters. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Bye. All right.